So, okay, this talk will be a little bit more technical and uh, will uh, explain one of the applications we are developing currently. Okay, first of all, to introduce uh, Comcast. So, actually, we are the third largest internet provider worldwide. So, we have lots of networks, which means lots of problems that go with it, and not obvious problems. We are most known for providing TV, uh, sports, entertainment. Uh, we have the studios, Universal Studios. We are also running uh, the Universal Studios, so you can visit and so on. So lots of fun going on in the company. We have also other parts where uh, we have home security systems that are a bit less well known, but they plug to IoT, as well as voice over IP. Now, big, big picture, very big uh, infrastructure. And once we have problems, the troubleshooting might be complex, uh, very often. And uh, when I take a small example, like somebody wants to get a video on demand, and they try to get it and cannot get it. So it looks very frustrating for the user because they cannot see what they want to see. It's bad for us because we don't make a transaction and so on. But when you look in the reason why we have such kind of failures, there can be so many reasons. Because there is billing that is involved, if the customer has not been paying bills, cannot see the movie, the resource must not be available at one particular point. We might have service issues because the network is uh, overloaded and so on. We might have hardware issues. People can also unplug the setup box and, you know, then after it's not working anymore. And software issues with updates and so on. So basically, uh, call centers have a very tough task to solve this kind of calls when they are coming in. And when, oh, when you are looking and analyzing where the problems can come from, there are so many sources. And we have so many streams of data. We, we collect uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of data. And we have to find out where the error comes from and what we can do to help the users, as well as the call center people, because there are so many reasons, and they have to answer like this to customers that is probably not very happy, because they have to call to get the service they wanted to get. Now, the goal of our project is actually to improve the customer experience, of course. And one way of doing is actually to keep the customer better informed, because sometimes there's a, diff a, discrepancy, a discrepancy between what they expect and what we have to deliver to them, so there, there can be a difference there. Um, but also, we need to empower the care agents, because they get all these calls, and it's a very complex issue to find out, you know, is it billing, is it something else? Because the customer might not know, you know, if I call, I would just say, oh, it doesn't work, you know, it's a technical problem. Well, it can be due to something else. So what we want to do is to use data mining to improve the to give a hint to the care agents so that they can really narrow down to what is the real reason of the call. And, of course, we aim to have high uh, a first call resolution so that we can be fast and efficient. And in the long term, what we want to do is, of course, self-healing. So for some, in some cases, we can make self-healing because uh, in the network we might find out some signatures of some things that are wrong. But in some other cases, we need to send a truck there, and you know, we have to replace hardware, we have to replace wires, and so on. So the idea is really to be able to predict what we have to do and to do uh, an effort as soon as possible so that people have better service without being disruption, disrupted. So the goal of this project here is actually the following, is we have the setup boxes that are in each and every home. And these boxes, they send us error messages. And these error messages, they, gave us, they, they might give us a kind of a signature of what is the problem that is going on. And the setup boxes have something like 150 different messages that we get, and in time, you know, you can, you, you can trace it over time. And when you look at these 150 possible error messages you get and you trace them over time, you get a kind of a signature that is a state of what is going on in the home of this kind of user. So the first prediction we want to do is to know if this particular user will call us. 
And the second one is, if they call, why do they call us? So that's the problem we solve here. So predicting if users are calling, actually, so we, we use as a classic way of doing data mining, so we look into signatures that are coming in, and uh, we use a gradient boosting machine, and we got something like 66% of accuracy. So I could try all possible possibilities by changing the modeling, introducing new features, whatever. It was a glass ceiling, you know. There was no way to go above 66. 66, not great, you know. 50% being random, 66, <laughs> just slightly better. So, of course, I looked in what was missing in this modeling, and when you think about it, it's like, hmm, what is missing? Is the guy calling us or not? Well, obviously, you need to model the user. And once you model the behavior of the user, you will find out that we have some users that are calling very quickly, and some others they will never ever call because maybe they're not even watching uh, TV and so on. So they're not seeing what is going on. So just by looking at this uh, user and modeling them over time, we could uh, reach 79% uh, of accuracy, which becomes uh, reasonable because now we can make some kind of prediction, will these people call or not? And we can actually then uh, send recommendation to call centers saying, hey, this guy might call you very soon, you know, watch, watch out, and so on. We could also send uh, some kind of recommendations to users saying that, hey, we noticed that something is wrong in your installation and you are working on it to fix it. So that's a way to use this. So, of course, next question would be, why do they call? You know, the call centers will tell us, <laughs> hey, it's nice to tell us the guy call, but tell us why they call us. Okay, and that's here uh, I introduce um, comparisons with H2 versus SparkML. So I do most of my work uh, in Spark, and I use SparkML here. So knowing why people call, so actually uh, the structure is the following. Since there are so many issues that can come up, the call centers actually are split in sub-buckets because you will have one specialist, you know, for reconnection over the wireless and so on, some other for uh, solving the keywords, some others for billing and so on. So basically the goal here was out of 10 different buckets being able to find out what family of problems we have to solve for a particular signature that we see uh, in our temporal model. So by using, again, gradient boosting, which is uh, the best working here, could make a quick comparison between H2 and SparkML. And basically, H2 was always better. So I, I got better accuracy, 47%. Processed like five times faster. I had no memory problems, while in SparkML, I had really to massage my data so that I get down and was able to run without uh, problems with memory. And also, I have a UI that is much more friendly in H2. Uh, so H2 was really the winner on this thing. Now, when I think about it, 47% of accuracy, still not great, you know? Uh, but out of 10 buckets, it's uh, about five times better than random. So. It's good, but you would not put something uh, like this in production because, you know, half of the time we have a wrong answer. So we explored another way of doing, and actually the first idea that would come to mind is instead of having one algorithm that tries to slot you in 10 different buckets, you will make 10 highly specialized algorithms, each of them predicting if they are within the bucket or outside. Very easy to do, especially in uh, H2O. What you do, you take your general buckets, which are 10 there, you make some uh, binary buckets here, and then you make the learning for each of those. Okay? So, as we say it, we do it. We use, again, gradient boosting. We compare Spark ML and H2O. I'm not going details. The takeaway is simple. H2 is always better. And actually, I was blown away for the, the last bucket I have here, technical. I went from 66 to 87 percent. So it was very, very significant. And that is actually the, the most tricky of the buckets. So having gotten those results, now I have 10 different algorithms that are really good, you know, because they would get the result 95 percent of the times right if I'm in an ideal world. But there's still one step that is missing. Now that I have 10 algorithms, I need to have kind of uh, algorithms that puts all of them together so that I can go from the one to the other or make some kind of vote between those 10 algorithms. 
So that's what you do here. Again, I use on top of it a gradient boosting machine to make the choice so that I, I use the best algorithm at the right moment for the right user. So it looked good again. And so this time, when I look at the overall result, I got 60%. So I was 47 before. Now I'm 60%. It's getting good, but still kind of frustrating because I expected 95 here in my ideal world. In the real world, I'm just at 60%. So there's something better to be done there. And for the rest of the comparison, it's, it's, a, it's a classic I always have. Is H2 is faster, has uh, less uh, memory issues, and so on. So I had still my key problem to explain is why do I have such a violent drop between my ideal expectation of 95 and my real life 60%. So of course, as a data scientist, you cannot sleep when you see this. You have to find <laughs> an explanation, and maybe an explanation that you can give to your boss. It's even better than just for yourself. So that's what we did, uh, and uh, we really uh, took advantage of, of H2. So I, I programmed for the following nothing. I just used what I had in H2. Since I had created these 10 different algorithms, I had also the prediction for each of those 10 algorithms, which means that I could make a comparison for each of the algorithms and uh, make uh, the, the rock comparison so that for each of the packets, I will know if I'm a good predictor or if I'm a so-so predictor. And H2 gives me all the interfaces to do that. So I did this, and surprise, surprise, I did find out that out of my 10 buckets, eight of them are really, really well predicted, but two of them are <laughs> really bad and really pitiful. And I, I have actually the rock charts of both of them here. So actually, we have a major problem. Those two buckets are completely overlapping, and there's no way for the data mining to make a difference between the one or the other. So then my first recommendation was to go back to the guys who made those packets and challenge them, saying, hey, guys, did you really think it through? You know, I have a problem to separate them. So there might be a major issue there. We should maybe redesign them. Now, going further, the question would be, what do I win if I would be able to predict one of these packets perfectly? Just one. Well, again, it was trivial to do in H2O because I was running then all the estimators here. And for the one bucket that was problematic, I just put the solution in it. And immediately I could see that if we would fix this particular bucket here, my uh, accuracy would jump to 75%. So that's a very good incentive that I can give to my product people because I say, if you fix it, you know, we'll be much better with this one. And of course, I did it also by fixing both buckets where we will have then 86% of accuracy and you can put this into production. So it's a very simple forecast. I just used what is existing in H2O. But it's really worth gold because I could really narrow down to what is the problem and what we have to fix. And we don't have to fix the whole thing. We have just to fix two little packets. But we have really to think about those two. So that's really valuable because it's a large uh, space problem. And we can really narrow down to what needs to be done. So what's my conclusion? Uh, I had to choose. And do I continue using a Spark ML? or H2, well, <laughs> it was very simple. <laughs> In all of the examples I had, H2 was more accurate. It was faster. It uses less memory, <laughs> with, without, uh, without exception. And also, my studies were really accelerated because I had the UIs. The minimal UIs that are given in, in h 2 are very, very smart. And thanks to these UIs, I could really understand much better my use case than without having them. And last thing is it's very stable. I, in all my experiments I made, h 2 never, ever crashed. And that's very valuable. Now. There's still room for improvement. Since I was using sparkling water and was amongst the first ones, we had some instabilities in sparkling water. But it was very easy to design around it, because what we did is, 
instead of going through sparting water into H2, we just generated CSD files and we read them into H2. So that's how we work now, and it gives perfect results. So I'm here to take any questions, if you have. Or anyway, I will stick around the whole day if you want to talk about those kind of examples. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you or someone else can explain the, perform the accuracy differences between the Spark and the H2O implementations of the gradient boosting machine. Are there um, substantial differences in the, um, well. Is the implementation, you mean? Yeah, in the, in the, in the implementations of the two algorithms. Um, I think Arno would probably be the best guy to answer this one because he implemented it, so I'm just a user. I'm <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow, well done. Nice throw. So H2O has several advantages over Spark um, in terms of m machine learning models, right? It's, it's designed to do nothing else. It's designed to um, not make any redundancy in the, in the pipeline. So if, if one node goes down, H2O dies. But at the, at the cost of having redundancy, you, you become slower. So Spark is slower by nature because they have to do everything in a way that's redundant. If anything goes down, they can restore that state from scratch. So they have a graph that they have to store. Every step has to be like a transactional database. They have to make a, a recording of everything they do. We don't. We just have a big scratch space like a pocket calculator. You just type it in. You compute it. You erase it. You compute something else. We basically overwrite stuff in memory all the time without having a, a trace that says, oh, I was changing this value here and this array in this matrix. So having this, this scratch space where we can play using computer science and supercomputing knowledge gives us the ability to be as fast as it gets. And we have Fortran speeds, basically. Even though we're using Java, everything is um, programmed to be as fast as it gets. Like the memory access, we are storing the numbers not as, as uh, doubles and longs, but as raw bytes. And they get compressed and decompressed on the fly. So there's all these efficiency hacks um, obviously designed by Cliff, the co-founder, who wrote the Java just-in-time compiler. So he knows exactly how, how all the JIT works, the, the, the real-time compiler that runs this code, right? So it's all, it's all highly optimized. And another thing is, of course, since we control the entire stage that does nothing but machine learning, we can optimize the memory footprint. So we can write the algorithm to be as efficient as it gets to do just GBM and to optimize every piece of it. And that's all we do, right? We spend our days optimizing these algorithms. So there's definitely that. And the stability, yes, we're, we're, our customers are important to us. So we fail fast. We, we let you try it four years ago. We fix it. And then now, by now, it's, it's stable, right? That's what happens when you have hundreds or thousands or actually 10,000s of customers that are using us. It's, it's, it's good to be open source. It gives you this feedback that you would never get if you were closed source. So thank you very much, Bernard. That was great. Thank you for the good work. <laughs>